Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. The ability to adapt rationally, to mold our thinking in reaction to what we see as the rules of reality, is one of the strongest abilities a person possesses. Because of this, one of the strongest fears we have is the possibility of finding ourselves in a reality that we can't adapt to, can't make sense of. This is the occult occurrence that befalls our unfortunate protagonist in tonight's spine-chilling story, The Thing in the Back Rooms, by that exo guy. How many doors have you opened today? How about in the last week, month, or year? What about in your entire lifetime? The answer to that is probably many. Yet, if you're reading this right now, probably not enough. So, consider yourself lucky. Or, luckier than me at any rate. My ordeal started about five months ago. It was a usual day. Wake up, go to work, be bored out of my mind. Only, it was a night. I work the night shift at a... Well, I worked the night shift at a small pawn shop and the night passed at a glacial pace. That's usually good news as I browse the internet on my phone, but my charger did that thing when you sleep and it just fucking disconnects, leaving you with no battery to speak of. And me being me, I didn't notice until I'd gotten to work. Great. So I was alone, bored out of my mind for some 10 hours, but the night eventually passed. A co-worker came in as the morning broke, so I left. On my way to the car, I stopped at a local mart, and I grabbed a couple sandwiches and a water bottle. I was too lazy to make myself something to eat when I'd get home, so I figured I'd just wolf down the sandwiches and go to sleep. The commute was only ten minutes long, and it passed in a blur as I couldn't be bothered to pay attention to anything. My mind had melted under the boredom, to the point that I couldn't wait to get home to plug my phone in and watch some YouTube. I pulled up in my driveway and went for the entrance, fumbling for my keys. When I finally found them, I opened the door and entered, still not paying attention to my surroundings. Had I been a little less negligent, had I looked inside before going in, my life would have been so different today. But I didn't. The door clicked shut behind me, and I made my way to the kitchen through the corridor. I was also searching through my backpack for one of the sandwiches. I finally noticed something was off when I reached the place where the table should have been, but didn't bump into it. There was supposed to be a chair here for me to sit down in and eat my meal, but there was nothing. I looked up frantically and noticed that the table was gone entirely, along with all of the furniture in my kitchen. The drawers, the fridge, even the damn sink. Not a trace of them remained. I was dumbfounded, to say the least. Did someone break in and steal everything when I was gone? But why? How? On a closer inspection, though, I realized it hadn't been thieves because the sink's drain was gone, replaced by a smooth wall instead. No one could have done this in the ten hours I was at work, and even if they could have, I couldn't fathom a reason for them to. Looking up, I saw the light bulb was gone as well. At that point, I started freaking out, badly, because light still emanated from where the bulb used to be. I grabbed my backpack and ran to the front door, hastily opening it. The street was gone. In its place, only another empty room. I let out a yelp of mixed surprise and fear as I froze in the doorway. What the hell was going on? Remembering my phone, I pulled it out and prayed that it still had some battery, but I was out of luck. The damn thing was dead. I took a few minutes to calm down and decided what to do. My breath smoothed out after a while, and I felt confident enough I'd not have a panic attack, so I closed my eyes and opened the door again. Still a room instead of the street. Crap. I explored the rest of the house, hoping to find something that would help me understand. But every room was the same story. 
All the furniture was gone, the walls were uncharacteristically smooth and featureless, and the light bulbs were nowhere to be seen, even though there was plenty of light to go around. I'd hoped against all odds that I'd still find my landline phone in the living room, but I think you can guess how well that went. I don't know how much time I spent curled up on the floor of the living room, just crying. And I don't know how much time I spent opening and closing the front door, hoping it would finally reveal my street to me. Many hours at any rate, until I finally gave up and decided to take a leap of faith. I entered the room my front door led to, closed it behind me, and opened the door again. Now, my corridor was gone, its place taken by a small room with a single door on the other side. If someone would have been there with me, they could have pointed out the exact moment my soul shattered by the pop it made. But no one was there. I was all alone and lost in a twilight zone of empty rooms. I sat down, pulled my backpack into my lap, and took a sip of water. I didn't feel hungry yet, so I decided not to touch the sandwiches. With only two of them and a liter of water, I had to make them last. My mind went into survival mode, and I didn't know for how long I would be here, or how to get out. I eventually decided to take a nap as I was still tired from the night shift that I'd been through. I decided that I'd have a better chance of figuring things out if I was rested. Sleep came swiftly, but it was fitful and bland as the room I was in. I didn't dream at all, and I constantly woke up feeling paranoid, like someone, something, was watching me. The fifth time that happened, I jumped to my feet. The room was dark now. I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. After I was done dropping bricks, I thought I'd died and was now in some sort of hell. But I walked around slowly and still found the walls of the room in about the places that I expected them to be. It clicked in my head. It was nighttime. This place, wherever or whatever it was, kept track of the time outside. I huddled myself in one of the corners and waited for the light to return. That took a few hours, but with nothing to draw my attention and excite my senses, it felt like a small eternity. There was only me, the darkness, the sounds of my occasional breath, and the pulse of my heart pounding in my ears. I thought I'd go crazy, that I'd start to hallucinate at any moment now, but then I noticed a small inkling of light emanating from the ceiling. Dawn was breaking. The light slowly grew in intensity, mirroring the pace of a sunrise, but I didn't wait any longer. The moment I could see even the vaguest of shapes, I got up and got on the move. Despite room after room, all I found was more of the same. The walls were different colors, and the shapes of the rooms varied to mirror their purpose. A small closet, a garage, a bathroom, a corridor once in a while. But other than that, they were all the same. For a split second, I felt like I was in a video game and I'd entered an area that I wasn't supposed to. A building that the devs hadn't fleshed out because no one was meant to enter it. Only, this was reality, wasn't it? At one point, I got an idea. I kept finding windows which, although they didn't show anything on the other side, were flush with the walls. I thought maybe they would lead somewhere. So I threw my water bottle against one of them, hoping to shatter it, but it bounced right off and rolled back to my feet. The next few days were spent going from room to room, only stopping at night when I couldn't see a damn thing. But I made a few interesting discoveries, if you want to call them that, about how this place and my body worked now. Closing a door randomized the room on the other side so you could walk in a circle without going into the same room twice. As soon as a door left your direct line of sight, even if you had left it open, it would close on its own. This one I figured out after I'd had the bright idea of not closing any doors behind me, hoping that I'd managed to figure out how big the place was. I didn't need sleep, or at least I didn't need it as often as I normally would. 
Despite a few days having passed at that point, I didn't feel tired anymore and I only slept through that first night that I spent there. Same went for food and water. I didn't feel hungry or thirsty even though I still had both sandwiches and the water bottle was missing only the few sips that I'd taken on that first day. That was either a curse or a blessing depending on how you chose to look at it. It would give me more time to find a way out, but it had the potential of prolonging my suffering immensely if I didn't. I decided to take it as a blessing for the time being and kept going. Room after room, day in and day out, I think I opened more doors in that time than I would have in my entire life otherwise. But after roughly a week, I finally found something that wasn't just another bland wall. Though, I wish I hadn't. The first thing that hit me as I entered the room was the gut-wrenching smell. It was stagnant and putrid to the point that it made me wretch and made my eyes water. I slowly looked up and found red trails adorning the floor. They had a radial pattern that led back to a common source and looked as if they'd flowed at one point or another. As my eyes followed them slow and uncertain, my gaze came upon something in the corner. It was a dry husk, with its back against the wall and its hands beside its body. The trails led to its wrists, and I could see bone beneath the mummified skin. Words were strewn on the wall behind it, the same red color as the trails on the floor. I backed up slowly as the realization hit me like a truck. This person, whoever he or she might have been, was like me at some point. Someone stuck in here that couldn't take it anymore and decided to end it all. That was their only way out their only release, and I feared more and more each day that it would eventually be my only option as well. For hours, I fought back the urge to leave the room and shut the door behind me. The reality of what I was facing sunk deeper and deeper into my soul, bringing with it despair and a feeling of complete helplessness. Many slaps later, I managed to snap myself out of it and approached the corpse to inspect it. I thought that maybe they'd have something useful on them, though what exactly that could have been, I had no idea. Certainly no food or water, else they'd not have taken their own life. And certainly not a map that led outside, else I'd not have found them here like this. I fashioned a mask to cover my mouth and nose out of my t-shirt and walked over to it slowly. The words behind it came into view as I got closer, and I could read them when I was a few steps away. Beware the dark. Don't follow the footsteps. The eyes. Oh my god, the eyes. Make it stop. Now, I don't remember the words exactly, so I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that was the gist of it. Short sentences with an ominous feeling to them. They certainly did a good job of making me feel like I'd drowned in dread. I tried to puzzle them together and draw some meaning from them, but I couldn't. What eyes? What footsteps? I'd been there for more than a week now, but besides the sounds that I made myself, I hadn't heard anything. Still shat my pants at reading it, though. I kneeled down next to the corpse and started pulling on its clothes in search of pockets. It was dressed pretty blandly, jeans and a t-shirt, so I didn't find much. One of the front pockets of the jeans revealed a phone with no battery, and the back pocket revealed a wallet. There was a bit of cash in it, a few bills and coins but I decided not to even count it, let alone take it. But I found an ID and a driver's license, and I took those. I figured that if I ever got out, the least that I could do was turn these in and let the person's relatives know of their fate. His name was Brandon. Average looking, 25 year old guy, dirty blonde hair, and he had sparkling blue eyes. He didn't deserve this fate, and I didn't either. I found nothing else on him, so I decided to move on. Staying put wouldn't do me any good, and after finding Brandon's corpse, I felt a renewed sense of urgency. The next few days, I followed the same pattern as before, stopping only at nightfall. 
Before, I moved for as long as I could see, but with Brandon's warning to beware the dark, I began stopping the moment that the light started to fade. I was itching to move to keep my mind occupied so it wouldn't collapse on me, but I was also afraid. I didn't need to see any monsters on top of all that I'd been through. As the second week came and passed, I was certain that I'd traveled for dozens of miles now, and more or less in a straight line as well. I'd grown properly hungry in the meantime, so I ate one of my sandwiches and held on to the other one until I'd literally be starving. I was also down to half of the bottle of water, but if my body kept it up at the same rate, these meager supplies would have lasted me for another month or two. That was until I found her. As I entered another room, I saw someone huddled in a corner. Now, thinking it was another corpse, I approached it slowly, my nerves on end. It looked shriveled and malnourished, but I couldn't tell how long it had been dead now. Decomposition was probably affected the same way as my hunger and thirst, which was why my sandwich went stale, but was still edible. But then she opened an eye. She looked at me with horror and started to scream. I covered my ears to shield them from the loud screech, and it took everything that I had in me not to bolt it right out that door. She screamed for a solid 30 seconds before she stopped to gasp for air, but I could see that she was ready to do it again. Stop that! I yelled. I won't hurt you! She opened both eyes, and they were wide with surprise, a look of disbelief and then of relief washed over her features and she huddled down tighter. Help me. Please, oh God, if you're a real human, help me. I rushed over to her and kneeled down. She looked bad, but knowing that she was still alive in her condition made it so much worse. Her face was scrawny, her skin pulled taut over her bones. Her clothes looked a few sizes too big, hanging loosely on her tiny frame. Her hair was disheveled, dirty, and bunches of it had fallen off to reveal her bare scalp. What happened to you? I asked, although I probably knew the answer. Do you have anything to eat? Or some water? She asked. I considered for a moment uh, whether I should lie and tell her no, but I couldn't have lived with myself if I did that, however long I still had to live anyway. I opened my backpack and offered her the sandwich. She wolfed it down in a few seconds and then licked the plastic wrap clean. Thank you so much, she said after she was done. I haven't eaten in months. I gave her the water bottle too. and told her to drink it slowly. Now, I was no expert in nutrition or malnutrition or starvation, but I knew that if the stomach was empty for a long time, it wasn't a good idea to stuff it all of a sudden. She, of course, didn't listen to me and drank the water in a few gulps. I really couldn't blame her, though. I can't even imagine what it felt like to not eat or drink for months. We stood in silence for a while as I allowed her to regain some of her composure. She eventually opened her mouth and started to talk, and to this day, I still regret hearing her words. Have you seen it? She asked. Seen what? So you didn't travel through the dark then? She continued. No, no I haven't, I answered. Can't see shit, so when night comes I stay put. Good, she said. You didn't answer me, though. See what? I asked again. I tried to get more out of her, but my attempts all met with failure. She didn't evade my questions. She outright shot them down and told me it was for my own good. Seeing that I didn't relent, however, she eventually told me something. Listen, you really are better off not knowing. Believe me, just... Don't travel through the dark, and you'll probably be safe. Fine, I said, accepting defeat. The terror in her voice wasn't hidden, not at all, and it was laid thick on every word she spoke, so I didn't pester her further. Still, her questions and her cryptic words felt eerily familiar. Brandon's words, written in blood, came to mind. Beware the dark. 
I stayed at her side as the day passed and the night settled, even though I was itching to get on the move again. I'd not seen another human or spoken to anyone in over two weeks, and although I thought I'd never miss it, that changed. I was starved for conversation, for interaction, and most importantly, for information. Her name was Vanessa, she was 25 years old, and she'd been living a few towns over from me. One day, three months before I'd found her, she went to the bathroom in her own apartment. Preoccupied with her phone, she didn't check on the room that she entered. Only when the door was shut behind her and she was cut off from the outside world did she notice that something was up. By then, it was too late, and she had been trapped in here ever since. Her story sent chills down my spine, and it was very similar to mine. In a moment of distraction, she walked through a door that she'd opened countless times before, only for it to lead her here. The gears in my head started spinning as I began to theorize how and why. I knew these rooms were copies of real ones. That much was evident from day one, seeing as I entered my own house and thought someone had stolen all of my furniture. And I knew they were randomized upon closing doors, but where was this place? Outside of our reality? Did we enter it because we weren't paying attention, or was it something like quantum mechanics, where the contents of the room weren't decided until they were observed? That I didn't know. It could have been any one of them, a combination of them, or something else entirely. Anyway, after Vanessa and I talked some more, she fell asleep. She was obviously weak, so I didn't wake her. I stood by her side as the lights slowly dimmed, hoping that she'd get enough strength back the next day to walk. I myself couldn't sleep. In fact, ever since I'd gotten here, I had only slept that one time through the first night. The rest of them I spent awake, pondering my predicament and my life thus far. Tonight, I was glad to have someone next to me, even though all I could hear was her steady breathing. I wasn't alone anymore. And that was really the only thing that mattered. About halfway through the night, I got up and paced around through the room for a bit to stretch my legs. I would do this every night to stop my muscles from going stiff, but I never left the rooms that I was in. At one point, I stopped, after maybe ten minutes of walking in circles. I listened for Vanessa so I could return next to her, and it didn't take me long to pick up on her breathing. But before I could take a single step toward her, I heard footsteps. I stood as still as I could, listening, hoping my mind was only playing tricks on me, but it wasn't. Although they were faint and sounded like they came from very far away, I could clearly make out every step. They were slow, with a few seconds between them, but they followed a steady rhythm. I turned to face the direction they seemed to come from and took a few steps of my own. Slow and careful not to make a sound, I inched forward until my outstretched hand met the wood of the door. I leaned against it, pressing my ear to the wood, and heard the footsteps clearer. I hoped that it would be another person. I hoped that Vanessa and I would get another companion to help us out, but the more I listened, the more that hope was eroded away until it shattered entirely. The steps were too heavy for a normal human, too drawn out, and beside that, the room they seemed to come from wasn't decided yet. For all intents and purposes, I shouldn't have been able to hear them at all. The moment that realization hit me, Brandon's warnings and Vanessa's questions suddenly made sense. A deep sense of dread and fear took over me, and I made my way next to Vanessa without even taking a single breath. The night passed one heartbeat at a time, one footstep at a time, because they never went away, not until the light returned in full. At that point, I woke Vanessa up. She came to her senses slowly, and she noticed the change in my demeanor. Did, did you see it? Was the first thing that she asked me. No, I answered. Did you hear the footsteps then? She continued with her questioning. Yes, I admitted, but I didn't follow them. We should be safe then, she said after a long pause. Vanessa tried to get up on her own, but she couldn't. She was still too weak. 
and we both doubted that a sandwich and a bit of water would change that. I helped her to her feet and threw one of her arms over my shoulders, basically dragging her along. You don't have to do that, she said as we walked toward the door opposite of the footsteps I'd heard during the night. I'm not going by myself, I cut her short. If I spend another night awake by myself, I'll lose my fucking mind. She didn't say anything else. Having been alone for the past months, she probably understood me perfectly. We spent the next day walking in a straight line, door after door, hoping one of them would lead us outside. It hadn't, of course, and by nightfall we stopped once again. I sat Vanessa down in a corner and laid down next to her. She lifted her right pant leg to reveal her shin, and I saw it was full of straight cuts in various stages of healing. I didn't know what to make of them, but they looked suspiciously like tally marks. With the nail of her thumb, she cut another line into her exposed skin. She winced a bit, but she didn't let out a sound. Seeing my confusion, she started explaining. I'm counting the days that I've been here, she said. On your skin? I asked, unnerved by it. I've got nothing else, she said. We talked a bit more, mostly about our lives. She had finished high school, but didn't pursue a higher education. That left her working at a restaurant as a waitress to make a living. There, she met the man that would soon become her boyfriend, and then her fiancé. He was the son of the owner, but from what Vanessa told me, he worked in the restaurant wherever he was needed. He sounded like a swell guy, to be honest. Anyway, the two of them had moved into an apartment by themselves a year prior, and they'd been happy together. Vanessa said she could already see the rest of her life with him until, well, this happened to her. I told her that I was in a similar position to hers, working a dead-end job in order to scrape by, only I'd wasted several years of my life going to college, getting a degree that never led me anywhere. I still lived with my parents in our small suburban home, hoping to find someone to share my days with and maybe start a family of my own. You can guess how well that went, I said, trying to pass it off as a joke. Vanessa managed to giggle, but I could tell that she really didn't feel the humor. I don't blame her, but I always found that humor alleviates bad situations, for me at least. We kept talking until the lights vanished almost completely, and we'd have done it even after that, probably all through the night, but something we heard stopped us. The footsteps. The goddamn footsteps. They returned as the last rays were gone, seemingly closer than last night. We held our breaths, listening in anticipation for what must have been hours. We huddled closer together, bunching into one another for a fleeting sense of safety. The night eventually passed and we were both still alive by the end of it, scared out of our minds, but alive. We spent about two more months traveling together, passing the days with small talk and the nights fearing for our lives. The footsteps got closer some nights, but if we kept quiet, they wouldn't approach us. We both got weaker by the day, withering away to hunger and thirst, but Vanessa was already much worse off than me. I didn't think someone could be that thin and still live, and I think that only her will to survive and see this through kept her alive at that point. We'd made very little progress for a few days, and I guess that we both knew that she didn't have long left, but we refused to acknowledge it. One evening, as we stopped for the day, she was too weak to even talk with me. She went straight to sleep, which worried me since I hadn't needed to sleep once I'd met her. When morning finally came and she woke up, she kept uncharacteristically silent. I waited half an hour for her to wake up fully before I suggested that we get on the move again, but she stopped me. Just leave me, she said in a weak voice. We both know I don't have much time left and I'm only slowing you down. No, I protested. This isn't some movie. You're not doing some heroic sacrifice for me. She didn't fight me about it. Maybe she was too weak to, or maybe she simply didn't care anymore, knowing that we'd both meet our ends in here regardless. Fine, 
She accepted my decision after a while. But at least let me tell you the truth. God knows how much time I have left. This might be my last chance to. I wanted to stop her, to contradict her and reassure her that we'd make it eventually, but I listened. I was curious, but I didn't want to risk braving this place alone without knowing exactly what I was in for. There's something in here with us, she said after a long pause. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's hunting us down. If you move during the night, it picks up on you, I think. Then it'll start circling the rooms in search of you, making those footsteps we've been hearing. If you make any noise, or if you follow the footsteps, it'll find you. Did, I started, but the words got stuck in my throat. Did you see it? I did, she admitted with surprising calmness. When I first got here, actually, I ran around for a few days, even through the dark. One night I bumped into it, but I didn't get a good look. I ran away like hell, and I guess I lost it. What did it look like, I asked, even though I was sure I'd regret finding out. It was tall, gaunt had spindly limbs, Vanessa said, and paused for a moment. Her sight got lost in empty space, and for a few heartbeats I was sure she wasn't there with me anymore, on a mental level. And those eyes, she eventually added, red, shining, and tears formed around her eyes and flowed down her cheeks, but her expression didn't change to reflect that. Haunting? I asked. She nodded her head. Okay, I said, that's, th that's enough. I'm not sure I want to hear more, and I'm pretty sure it's not doing you any good trying to remember it. She sheepishly nodded her head again, so we closed the subject. We got on the move at a glacial pace, with breaks every other hour or so for her to catch her breath. We mostly kept silent, with barely a few words exchanged between us, but I still appreciated her presence. I think that another week or so passed, and Vanessa weathered away visibly by the day. It wasn't long before she couldn't walk anymore, and she kept insisting that I either leave her or end her. But I couldn't do either, and I didn't. At least not in the meantime, for as long as I was able, I would carry her around on my back, which is exactly what I did. And even though she was more bone than flesh at that point, she still felt very heavy, a clear sign of my own degradation. We traveled less and less, starting up later and stopping sooner every day. Vanessa kept tallying the days on her skin until she ran out of room on her legs and had moved to her forearms. Bored one evening, we counted the marks and we found out that she had been in here for a little over six months. At the rate I'm going, she said after a while, I have maybe another month left. She didn't bring it up again, but I knew from the look in her eyes that she was afraid. Despite her inhuman amounts of resolve, she feared what another month in her condition would do to her. So much pain, so much suffering, and although she never said it, I knew she was angry with me for refusing to end it for her. That night was the first time I slept as well, and I can't describe how good it felt. Escaping that hell I was in, even for a few hours, was a blessing, but unfortunately, I didn't get to relish in it for too long. All of the stress, all of the anxiety, all of the worries that had built up in me, they turned into nightmares, and they ruined my rest. I dreamt of Vanessa dying, of me crying over her lifeless body, my resolve to continue shattered. But then she opened her eyes and reached a skeletal arm out towards me. I tried to scream and back away from her, but you know how well that goes in dreams. I was paralyzed, the yells frozen in my throat, and she threw me to the ground effortlessly. Why didn't you kill me? She asked, climbing over me and wrapping her fingers around my throat. I couldn't answer, and I could, in fact, barely fight her. I thrashed around beneath her and tried to scream again and again, but I was only met with failure. The struggle didn't last for long, though. Fortunately, the real Vanessa woke me up, but I let out a single loud screech as I came to and regained control of my body. It's alright. It's okay. You're okay, she whispered and covered my mouth. 
the silence that engulfed us was so all-consuming that I heard the beating of my own heart in my ears. I kept quiet as the shock of the nightmare faded away, and Vanessa did the same, not making a single sound. I could barely hear her breathing. As my senses adjusted, I heard something, faint and distant. Footsteps somewhere far away, and doors squeaking as they opened and closed. They got closer and closer, and I knew that the creature had heard my scream. It was only a matter of time until it would reach us. We have to move, I whispered to Vanessa. We'll be found. We can't outrun it, Vanessa said, and it'll hear us. It'll hear the doors. The footsteps got even closer, to the point that I could tell them apart. The creature was only a few rooms away at best. We don't have a choice, I said as I got to my feet. Let's go. We'll figure something out. I didn't wait for Vanessa to answer. The footsteps were maybe two rooms away, and we didn't have any time to argue any longer. I took her hands and pulled her to her feet, getting her on my back and taking off. I tried my best to move as quietly as possible, but as soon as I opened the first door, the footsteps quickened behind us. The door to our room opened just as we left it, and I heard a guttural scream from behind us. That was all that I needed to convince me to throw all caution aside. I sped up, not quite running, but hurrying to the best of my abilities. I went at random, opening and closing all the doors in my wake, but the creature was on to us. I didn't have the strength to go any faster or lose it. It soon caught up to us, and I turned my head around in time to get a glimpse of it. Dread invaded me at the sight of its glowing eyes filled with malice, and I almost tripped right then and there, but I kept going, and by some miracle, I stayed ahead of it for a little longer. Leave me, Vanessa urged. I'm a goner anyway. I'll buy you time to get away. No way in hell, I yelled back at her. Not an option. The next room was a flight of stairs with no other route in sight. I could barely make out a door all the way up the stairs, and with the way that I came from, blocked by the creature, I started ascending. I don't think I'd made it five steps before I tripped and was forced to continue on all fours. Vanessa was barely hanging on to me, and I felt her grip around my throat loosen. Whether or not she was letting go intentionally, I will never know. Your guess is as good as mine. At any rate, she didn't get to fall off my back. The creature caught up to us, and bounding up the stairs like a crazed animal, it got its calloused hands around my ankle. I tried to kick it away to keep going, but in a single motion it hurled me through the air and back down the stairs. I landed hard on my back, getting the air knocked out of me, and I heard Vanessa crashing to the floor somewhere to my right. Through the stars in my vision I could vaguely make out her form in the murky darkness, and she was completely still. Nessa! I yelled, crawling towards her. Just go! she yelled back. Get her words were cut short by the creature as it plowed into her. It picked her up off the ground so fast that its spindly body was just a blur of shadows and movement. I heard a loud thud as it pinned Vanessa against a wall and I heard her gargle as she tried to scream. Our eyes locked for that one final time and behind her gaze I saw a terrifying calm, an acceptance of her fate that I didn't think was possible. She mouthed, Go! one final time and her eyes left mine moving to meet those of the creature i didn't want to my heart screamed at me to stay to help to fight but my tired malnourished body fought me back and i found myself turning around limping away on all fours as i reached the door and left the room i heard a sickening sound of flesh and bone being torn apart as the creature let out squeals of satisfaction it had won. It got its prey. I went as fast as I could, closing all of the doors behind me, hoping that the rooms would get reshuffled and I'd be safe. More than once I was tempted to either stop or outright turn around, because what was the point? But I kept going until my lungs burned and my souls felt raw. The human survival spirit is a hell of a thing. After Vanessa's death, I have no idea of how much time passed. Days, weeks, a month. Even slowed down as it was, hunger and dehydration were finally catching up to me and I soon 
started resembling the state that Vanessa had been in during her final days. With my conscience lapsing in and out, spending more and more time sleeping each day, I picked a room and decided to just give up. To let myself die and just end the nightmare. But that didn't get to happen, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here telling you my story. One fateful evening, as the lights in the room dimmed to almost nothing, one of the doors opened. Two figures walked inside, shining flashlights in my face. I opened my crusted eyes slowly and tried to speak, but all that escaped in my mouth was a throaty rasp. Bloody hell, mate, one of the figures said in a thick British accent. He's still alive. Get him out! More people appeared from behind the two, brandishing shotguns and firemen's axes. Two of them grabbed me by my arms, hauling me up and carrying me along. I passed out on the way, but I was conscious for long enough to notice that they'd left every door open behind them. They also spread a thick steel rope as they went, which kept the doors from closing and shuffling. I made it out of the back rooms four months after I entered, and I woke up in a small town in northern Alaska. Seeing as I'm from West Virginia, I was quite a ways away from home. The local doctor defied the odds in treating me, and his idea of keeping me in the back rooms for another day while he gave me liquids and glucose was actually quite smart. He feared that bringing me back outside into the real world would have just caused my body to instantly collapse and die. I never did get to meet my saviors. By the time I woke up after a few days of non-stop sleeping, they were already gone. A pair of monster hunters named Damien, the British guy, and his apprentice named Miles. That's all I managed to get out of the locals. Men in Black arrived before long, and they made up a story about me being kidnapped by human traffickers for unknown reasons. When we were all on the same page, they contacted my family to let them know that I was alive. Transport was being arranged for me to return back home, and I made it without incident, but my life hasn't been the same since. For starters, I removed all of the unnecessary doors in my home, and I replaced the rest with glass ones so that I could always see what was on the other side. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to share Brandon's and Vanessa's fate with their families, and not from lack of trying. Believe me, I did try. But from the day I got home, those MIBs have been keeping me under surveillance. For how long they're going to keep it up, I don't know. I'm not even sure who they work for beyond a nebulous concept that they're part of some branch of the government. Anyways, uh, that's all I got. I wish I had reached a better resolution, uh, some sort of happy ending, but... I haven't. I'm a scarred, traumatized shell of a person, and no amount of therapy and meds can fix me. And I will forever be paranoid when opening doors. I will never again in my life enter a room without checking what's on the other side first. They say that what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Unfortunately for those who pay attention to general wisdom, they are often full of crap. So stay scary, my wildlings. Pay attention to where you are and what you're doing, even if it doesn't make sense. And make the most of your nights.